for coming and allocating your precious time. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nelly. And thank you so much, Professor. And thank you to all of you. It's a, an honor and a privilege to be with you today. I'm going to very briefly talk about cancer and environmental disease. And I'm going to move on to briefly explain that very, very early on in the process of understanding how environmental factors affected our health, there was an awareness that ionizing radiation, x-rays, could be dangerous. And within a decade of their discovery by um, Rentgen at the turn of the 20th century, within a decade of that, it was known that it could kill people who worked with it. So this was the assistant of Thomas Edison. He ended up losing his hands, his feet, and his life because he worked with radiation. Then there were women who painted on the watch dial the glow-in-the-dark numbers. They were the radium dial painters, and they used their mouth to sharpen their paintbrush, and they developed necrosis of the jaw, also within a very short period of time. What I found astonishing when I did my book, The Secret History of the War on Cancer, was that all of these facts were known in 1936. It's a remarkable, remarkable thing. And speaking of the history of science, Professor, may I comment to you that while it is true that we understand the history of chemistry through the men whose names are now associated with it, there is no question that it was women who were involved in synthesizing mercury, and gold, and copper, and iron, which were the earliest metals in India, in China, and Egypt. And there's records of this going back 8,000 years. Now, we don't have the names of these women or men who worked with them, but we know that they were involved in the early extraction and synthesis of chemicals. And for me, as a sometime historian of science myself, I want to put on nameless woman as, because we know that we find the artifacts left even in Bampo, which is one of the earliest matrilineal societies found in China near Xi'an, where you see the bowls and the cups that were made, copper and iron, and of course mercury was one of the earliest very toxic materials known to be synthesized and extracted. So when we do the history of what is understood in chemistry, of course it's the history, if you will allow me, of dead white men because that's the way we look at history, but the reality is it's nameless women who were involved in the manufacture. Uh, there were only names, Hypatia, uh, in Alexandria, in the third century AD. Uh, she, she has been uh, assassinated by the Taliban Christians of that time. And, uh, yeah. And uh, there were many women that uh, they were not directly related to the chemistry per se. For instance, Madame Curie, she died to discover radiation. Uh, yes, uh, polonium was named for her country of Poland from which she came. But let me continue my talk, and I'm sure you and I have much to discuss afterwards, if I may. Um, the point I want to share with you here is that there were well-known synergies between chemicals and radiation. Synergies is a very important concept here, because while we tend to focus on the chemical of the week or the year with a long name at a time, and they become popular, we think we control them and we move on, the reality is, life is a mixture, and we focus on individual chemicals because that's how we can study things, because we use the principles of Occam's razor and parsimony in studying things. But the reality is, we live in a mixture, and we must recognize the need to reduce and control the polluting environment in which we live, which does leave our grandchildren today growing up in a sea of plastics, and radiofrequency radiation that never existed before. And it's a mistake, I believe, to try to focus on only one of these at a time. And yet that's what we would do with the scientific method. And here I will present you some of the earliest work on the scientific method. This one, done in 1936, showing that if you painted coal tar on the skin of rats and you exposed them to sunlight, which is a form of radiation, of course, solar radiation, you could accelerate the growth of these tumors that you can see here 
in coming out of the heads of these animals. And the younger the animals, when they were first exposed, the faster the tumors grew, which is still true today for almost anything we study. Younger animals are going to develop a more toxic response. Now, I share this with you because it's an amazing image. This was, in fact, the cover of Time magazine. And this was the director of the American Cancer Society. Look at him. With a pipe, a lit, isn't that wonderful? He left that job to go on to become the founding director of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Tobacco Industry Research Council, which became one of the most influential scientific organizations of its time for many years, for many years. So this is to understand the tobacco industry was a very legitimate, highly respected industry, which funded work for many years, aimed at trying to show that the cancers that were forming from tobacco were due to genetic predispositions. That was this man's entire life work. And I show that to you because we must be aware something similar is operating today, as I will say in a moment. Now, this is a book that recently came out edited by Martin Walker, and it includes a number of chapters, one of which is from me, on the way that companies got into a close relationship with the government in order to suppress science. And I would suggest, unfortunately, that that relationship sometimes continues to this day. In particular, Robert Kehoe, who was known as the founder of industrial hygiene, and there are buildings named for him in the United States today, was a U.S. Army captain working for the Secret Service in the United States, the equivalent of it. He was assigned to go to Germany in order to study what they knew about chemical warfare, but also, by the way, what they knew about chemicals in the workplace, and in particular studied some of the synthetic dyes that were being used and had been manufactured in Germany. He interviewed Ferdinand Fleury. This is the man shown here in his custody. But he later emancipated Fleury so that Fleury could go on to come to the United States and do research, just like Werner von Braun. And we had a whole group of German scientists who were exempt from the fact that they had built the V2 rocket and had pioneered in destruction and death and brought to the United States where their brilliance allowed us to build our rockets and our chemical industry. Now, I'm not opposed to rockets, nor am I opposed to chemicals, but I think it's important for history to understand that there are some dark sides to all of what went on. And in the meantime, Willem Hooper, who was a true pioneer in industrial cancer studies, did not realize that every single study he was doing for the US government, which he was doing, for the National Cancer Institute, was secretly being sent to Robert Kehoe for his independent review. So that that basically meant that Kehoe's work was always uh, uh, overseeing that of Hooper. And Hooper was not able to be able to get full traction for his findings, which showed, by the way, that 100% of the men who would work with certain dyes would develop bladder cancer within 30 years. He showed that work, and once he showed it to the American experts, they then told him, you must now study animals. Perhaps there's something unusual about these workers. So now he became an expert in studying animals. He developed the, the same methods that we use today to study animals, which is to expose one group and leave another group not exposed, use different dose levels, and then determine whether or not something causes cancer. Those methods are still being used today, but the same unfortunate relationship is still operating in many governments, which is that if the industry has a chemical of interest, of high volume interest, then they get the information before it becomes public, and they determine how it's released and where it's published. Another example of this was this pioneering woman who I was privileged to know in the later years of her life. She was almost six feet tall. Her mother had been a physician, 
So she was from a very upper class British family. And when she, in the 1950s, she began to interview women about the fact that their children had developed leukemia. And she concluded from her interviews of women that it was their exposure to x-rays when pregnant that caused the leukemia in their children. She was ridiculed. She was, they made fun of her. How, how dare you interview women and ask them? They don't know anything. You have to look at the doctors, they said. Now this was a woman who, by the way, herself had had four children, so she knew something about both ends of the problem, so to speak. <laughs> she persisted, and only years later, when Richard Dahl finally conceded she was correct, were her findings put into policy, and they stopped doing x-rays of women during pregnancy. Radiation risks of CAT scans. It's important for you all to recognize, and I won't have time to go over this because I have been asked to talk about cell phones, and I have been told that I have a few minutes more because I'm going to try to cover such a broad topic here. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. But I want to show you that a chest x-ray here on the bottom, at the bottom line, sorry, on the bottom line, the chest x-ray here is one, and you can see that there's one chest x-ray, but look how many chest x-ray equivalents there is if you look at the pediatric head CT scan that is in a machine not adjusted to the size of the baby. You can get up to 6,000 chest x-rays from one CT scan in the head of a baby. This is if the machine is not properly calibrated. And at the time I published these data, which was in my a Secret History of the War on Cancer book. <clears throat> that was 2007. At that point, I was professor at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute, and I went to the American College of Radiology, and they issued a white paper that concluded that there was a radical need to improve, to improve the use of CAT scans for children. And now, all over the world, pediatricians are aware that you must reduce the dose whenever you're doing a CT scan of a baby. Now look, if a baby is unconscious, you may need to do a CT scan, but you should do one, and it should be done at the lowest possible dose, as low as reasonably achievable. And that is, in fact, where medicine is today, although, unfortunately, still in emergency rooms, some doctors are not aware of this. Now I want to turn to another aspect of the cancer story, since you asked me to begin with that, Nen. Uh, with Harvey Babbage, we wrote a series of papers on DBCP, which was dibromyl chloropropane, a very widely used gaseous pesticide that was applied to bananas and pineapples prior to their being shipped to suppress the growth of insects, which it did very well. And what we learned was the following, and now I have to tell you a personal story. I worked for the administrator of EPA in 1976 to 1981, I guess. That is where I first met Professor Ashford. He and I go back a long time. And he served on the administrator's um, advisory committee on toxic substances, and I was the executive secretary. And we, it was an honor to work with him then, it is an honor to be with him today. And he said then, as he says now, that we've got to make fundamental changes in the way we approach these things in our society. But what I learned was the following. EPA was just getting started. We were just coming up with a program of how do you control toxic substances? It was not actually obvious at the time. And suddenly, a report comes across the administrator's desk. A group of men who were on a baseball team, have all been talking to one another about the fact that none of them has been able to get their wives pregnant. And for the first time, they realize they have this in common. They also realized very quickly that they all worked in the production of this chemical. That then put us, in the science advisory board where I was working, into high gear, and we began to look what did we know? At that time, and I'm not making this up, there were boxes, cardboard boxes of data. People would, and they, we called this malicious compliance. We would ask for information and they would give us boxes. There would be a room 
full of boxes, and you have to go through them. Well, we went through and we found a report from 1961, 1961, from Dow and Shell Chemical Companies, too, that they, at that time, did research on rats, on mice, and they showed that in those studies, at one part per million, at one part per million, you would get shrunken testes, testicular atrophy in these animals. That was a pretty remarkable finding, and the researchers said in that study in 1961, we advise they should only use gas masks when using this chemical. Well, I mean, obviously you know, in developing countries, they don't have gas masks, and people aren't reading English. Um, that piece of advice got ignored, but remember, the EPA at that time was run entirely by men at the top levels, by the way. <clears throat> and when this report came in that this could cause testicular atrophy, that chemical was the fastest regulated chemical in the history of EPA. And within very short order, it was banned, but it didn't stop the problem from spreading all over the world. There is still DBCP contamination in water. Some of the workers, unaware of this problem, would use it to kill fish. They would throw it in the water, and it killed everything, the group. So they would use it to kill the fish, take the fish home to feed their families. And uh, obviously, a bad idea. So what happened is that there were 20,000 men working in banana farms who became sterile. And they were able to file a lawsuit in Texas. And they, and they settled those lawsuits for more than $20 million. <clears throat> And shortly after that, Texas changed its laws prohibiting any foreign people from filing suit for damages. So that's one approach to the problem. Now, cell phones. What's the problem? I know, Professor, you put your phone in your pocket. How many of you have an iPhone with you? Hands up. I'd like you to take it out, please, and go to your settings. And I hope it is on airplane mode for your sake, as you'll see in a moment. Go to your settings and raise your hand when you're there. OK, now go to general, which is about seven down from the top. Raise your hand when you're there at general. All right? Now go to the top to about. Okay, hands up. About. Now go all the way down to something called legal. All the way down. And then click on RF exposure. Now read through, especially the paragraph above the hyperlink. And what it basically is telling you, and the language keeps changing, yeah, it does. is that if you have a phone closer than five millimeters or 10 millimeters, to your body, you can exceed the as-tested exposure guidelines. Now, I'm going to tell you that the exposure guidelines are 20 years old, and they were developed for a military or medical user of a man who is 220 pounds with a 12-pound head for a six-minute phone call. They were not assumed to be able to be carried on the body because the earliest phones in 1990s, which some of you may have had, were called a shoe phone. It could never fit in your pocket. It was a brick, right? Never. Nobody ever dreamed, no one ever dreamed, that children would be wanting these devices and iPads, which are also like phones, and that we would have this revolution that we have today in holding these <coughs> devices on the body. Now, let me be clear. I am a user of technology. I love the technological revolution and what it has done to transform the world. But it doesn't have to be wireless. It can be wired. And I bet those high speeds you have in India are because they went fiber optic cable to wire the downloads because you can transmit with fiber optic to homes or, or businesses and then you get this incredible speed 
whereas wireless cannot make up that speed. So now what's the problem? First of all, as you have just learned, I hope, by looking at the information inside your phone, if it's on airplane mode, you're neither transmitting nor receiving microwave radiation. It is a two-way microwave radio, and it is always on except when it's on airplane mode and Wi-Fi off. 900 times a minute, it's saying to the tower, where are you? Here I am. Where are you? Here I am. It's a handshake. Brain and sperm damage have been proven in humans. The damage to sperm has been shown in <clears throat> extensive literature reviewed by Professor Stan Glantz in the most recent textbook, Biostatistics in Medicine, and on our website of Environmental Health Trust, where they take sperm from a healthy man, put it into a test tube, and then they expose one test tube to cell phone radiation for two hours. The other is not exposed. Now, of course, sperm are not going to live in a test tube, but the rate of death in the sperm is three times faster in that exposed to cell phone radiation. And there's three times more damage to the mitochondrial DNA on the sperm, which is the engine of the sperm as well. Cancer risk has been established in animals and humans, and I'm going to show you briefly some of those data. There are synergistic effects with toxic chemicals. So all the toxic chemicals that most of us have spent our life working on, like lead as an example, which we know gets into the brain, and we know we have to protect young children from exposure. There is a synergy between the toxic chemical and exposure to this. And now, very interesting from a business point of view, for almost 20 years, Lloyds of London and Swiss Re do not cover health damages from cell phones. They've identified it as possibly the next asbestos. The French government is now recalling millions of phones and is the only country that is systematically testing phones to see their compliance with these 20-year-old standards. And international policies are lowering exposures, and I'm proud to say that India has lower exposures than many countries in the world, because IIT is really one of the top institutions. You now, with Amity and IIT, you have really covered the map in terms of uh, technology, and I'm very impressed and looking forward to learning more. And unfortunately, 5G is on the drawing boards, and it's going to require massive infrastructure and untested technologies and devices. So where are we now? This is just to give you a, a glimmer of some of the science, of which there's an extensive body, and recently there have been a series of articles published in the peer-reviewed journal Environmental Research uh, showing the effects on the testis. This is from the director of the Cleveland Clinic Infertility Unit, Asha Gagawal, also Indian, with an MD, PhD. And they show, you can see here, even if you know nothing about pathology, these are the control cells. They have nice borders, they look healthy, they have a nuclei. These are the exposed. And what you see in the exposed is what we call oxidative stress. Protein damage, heat shock proteins, weakening of membranes, the DNA damage measured in various forms that we validate and have used. And these histopathological confirmations are repeated <coughs> over again on many different species, on rat, on monkey, and yes, on humans. Now, this simulation from our colleagues in Brazil shows you the radiation that gets into your child's brain from holding a phone right next to the head. Watch as the colors move. The yellow is uh, the highest and hottest. And you'll see that if you are holding your phone next to your head, you're getting up to two centimeters into the brain of, of the higher exposure. We are seeing, in humans, increase of acoustic neuroma. That is a tumor on the hearing nerve. We are seeing an increase in glioblastoma multiforma, a very malignant, dangerous tumor. There are also reports that this may be associated with thyroid cancer and thyroid abnormalities in children. And this, I want to stress, is a six-year-old. Unfortunately, we've recently published studies with three-year-olds because people are using these devices in many countries like pacifiers. 
There are more than 10,000 apps for infants and toddlers. I've written a book about this, and most of you have never heard about it, and that's also not an accident, but I want to let you know it is available on Amazon, and here it is. And actually, again, in India, with Jimmy Chawa, I received more of a reception and with the Young President's Organization and other groups, uh, because India is fascinating to me in many ways. It has the most brilliant, high-tech people in the world, really. And it has huge problems for which the technology can be applied to solve many of those problems. We've had decades of research on this issue, and some showing testicular damage in humans go back to the Soviets. But again, that's only information that I've discovered recently by going through secret archives that were given to me by some of the former workers of the Office of Naval Research in the US. These are not widely known. And I wish sometimes, David, I'd never discovered this issue because I thought I knew it all, but I, every day I learn what I don't know. And there's more and more to be discovered. This is virtual reality. How many of you have seen virtual reality yourselves? All right, it's very exciting, isn't it? But you would not want your child to put this thing in front of their brain for any period of time, I would recommend unless it's on airplane mode, and you can do that. You download to airplane mode, and then you can run the software or watch the movie. I'm not saying not to use these things, but you must use them safely. This means airplane mode, but look at what happens here. This is what we published. We have shown in the first demonstration in the world in a peer-reviewed journal with our leaders from the Federal Laboratory of the University of Porto Alegre in Brazil, that you get deeply into the heads of a child. Look again, here is the six-year-old. We've also done this, by the way, with a three-year-old. And look at how much more you're getting through into both eyes. The younger model will absorb more radiation, more deeply into the brain, and up to 30 times more into the hippocampus. How many of you have medical backgrounds? Just so I understand. So it's, let me explain that. The hippocampus is critical to memory and balance and impulse control and integration of information. We already have enough problems with our teenagers with impulse control. Imagine what this is doing on a population basis. The eyes of the child are going to get two to five times more exposure. And there's an increase in children needing glasses and having vision and hearing problems. So we don't really know uh, all of the causes of these problems in our children, but certainly this is one of them. Now in virtual reality, when the phone is right over the head, this is now looking from the top, you see again, the greater exposure of getting here into the child, getting into both eyes, and how deeply it gets into the brain. We are aware that this is a big deal. We take great lengths to protect our children with bike helmets, ski helmets, seat belts, car seats. I have grandchildren. You cannot travel. You're traveling like with an army of all the, all the gear and things you need to move around with young children nowadays. And yet, we're not protecting their brains from something that we know can be damaging over the long run. And I want to stress something here. No matter how much you've been using your phones and how often you've been carrying it in your pocket, starting from today, you can keep it in your pocket only on airplane mode. If you want to improve your sleep, turn everything off. No blue lights in your bedroom because blue light interferes with melatonin. There are simple things you can do moving forward. But one of the things you can all help us with, I want to introduce Theodora Scarato, who is sitting there, and um, she has cards that we make available, and you may take as many as you can give away. That's our only condition, is if we want you to give away the cards that we're going to be handing out to others, so that the information will spread, because we agree. Information and education are key to getting the information out, to changing the way democracy is working. Because as Nick will tell us, democracy rests on an informed public that freely consents 
to be governed, and we can't consent to what we do not know. And being denied the right to know is being denied a basic human right. It's fundamental. It's fundamental to democracy. Now, with respect to the physiological evidence, the newest study from the National Toxicology Program in the United States, using the same protocol that Villain Hooper pioneered in 60 years ago, looked at animals exposed in their lifetimes to the same amount of radiation that we will get in a 70 plus year lifetime. And what they did was seven days a week for the two years of the animal life, equivalent to about 70 of ours, exposed the animals starting during pregnancy, nine hours a day, 10 minutes off and on, to simulate what we would be exposed to. And what they found were all of these different cancers and precancerous conditions of the heart, the brain, the adrenal medulla. And in addition, they found multiple sites of DNA damage, not just one, multiple sites of DNA damage in the brain, in the heart, in the liver, uh, in the peripheral leukocytes, and increases in a number of other types of cancer. Now, these animal studies are what we use to develop drugs. How can we deny their validity when it comes to assessing an environmental contaminant, particularly one in which we are all exposed nowadays? The NTP results show increase of brain tumors, malignant gliomas, and schwannomas. In 2011, the International Agency for Research on Cancer declared cell phone radiation a possible cause of cancer. My book came out in 2010. So suddenly people said, oh, well, I guess you were right. The report from IARC could have come out even sooner, just as many other reports have been suppressed and delayed for a long time. The NTP report I just showed you was first requested in 1999. And it would have been available for publication according to their schedule in 2008. It wasn't until we organized an international meeting on this in 2009 that the NTP started their study with the Illinois Institute of Technology, our IIT, and they completed it, and then it took them three years to get to release it. So you ask yourself, what's going on? What we know about glioblastoma is that all of the case control studies ever done that have looked at people with 10 years or more of use shows a significant increase in glioblastoma. And the most recent is the French study here, Corot, a national study of all cases of brain cancer looking at how much they use the phone, how many hours they use the phone, did they use it for 10 years or more. And what you see here is that after 20 plus years of use, there's a threefold increased risk. And for Hardell, who so far is the only one to have ever done a study looking at children. If they start to use phones as children heavily, then continue for 20 years, they have four to eight times more brain cancer 20 years later. That's a terrible burden, and none of these people would have willingly accepted that. So we need to do a better job of communicating the nature of this risk and I see not so many young people here today, but those are the ones we have to really concern ourselves with. Those of us who are old, it doesn't much matter, frankly, because the latency for brain cancer is so long, 40 years probably, in the general population. But if you're a heavy user, after 10 years, it's a measurable increase in risk, and that is shown here. This is the interphone study. Uh, this is the appendix. This is Hardell from Sweden. And this is Corot, uh, the French national study. And all of these studies combined to have convinced my colleagues and myself to have published a series of papers recently calling cell phone radiation a human carcinogen based on the combination of the animal and the human data at this time. Now, the synergies I told you about, many of you 
has spent years studying lead. We understand lead competes with calcium. We understand that lead gets deeply into the brain, and the earlier exposure takes place, the more toxic the response, the harder to get rid of it. Again, we want to protect children, particularly before the age of two, because that's when the brain is growing. It doubles in size in the first year of life. This is a study from Korea. They found that children with blood lead levels that were rather low, by the way, only about two, above two ppm, which used to be considered safe, if they also were on the cell phones, they would have an increase in attention deficit disorder. And another study recently showed that if you had in utero exposures with higher levels of lead and uh, exposures to radio frequency, which is microwave radiation, that they had neurodevelopmental delays in children. Now, our children are our future, and we have got to do a better job of protecting them. 5G, it's the revolution, except there's one little story. Here's what's needed. For 5G to happen, we need to build the infrastructure first. So they're proposing to roll out in the United States, every 100 to 300 yards, a 30 foot tall, tall pole. And on top of the pole, there's going to be this. And at the base, there's going to be this. And below this, there's a thick cable going up to the top that goes up to these. And this houses a million simultaneously operating small antennas that can simultaneously send and receive at the same time. I said a million, I'm sorry. I meant to say 1,000. Each one of these houses 1,000 multiple in uh, MIMO antennas, multiply in, multiple out. They can operate at the same time, okay? It's great, except it only works in the laboratory. And because the signals can't go very far, that's why you need so many of them. Guess what can interrupt the signals? How about rain, snow, trees? In other words, it's going to be a huge experiment at our expense. And in the United States, some people are asleep. And so they managed in the last omnibus appropriations bill to sneak in authorization so that no locality can object to the location of anything. That's federal law in the United States. It is being challenged in California, in Oregon, in many places. But that is the new federal law. The biological effects of 5G, they have been studied a bit. And what we know from work done for the Defense Agency Research Program, DARPA, by Israeli physicists, that 5G resonates with the sweat ducts of the human skin and that they are helical, just like an antenna, so that your skin becomes like the antenna for 5G. Now, why is that important? Well, <clears throat> it can accelerate bacterial, viral, and cancer cell growth. It can weaken membranes, and it has positive effects. It actually has been shown to suppress cancer growth, and it can stimulate opioid receptors, so you don't feel so much pain, but the trick is how much power is being used because it can damage the eyes. If you go through those airport screening devices in the United States, close your eyes because the eye has no cooling mechanism and it can damage the eye. And I certainly, if it, those of us who are of a certain age, we don't need any additional damage to our eyes. Now, I want to show you, hopefully it will work, um, this video of what has gone on in the U.S. Defense Department as a demonstration. These service personnel playing the role of an unruly mob at Georgia's Moody Air Force Base are about to fall prey to an invisible ray. The hulking panel atop this Humvee is part of what the U.S. military calls the Active Denial System, or ADS. It's designed to incapacitate enemy combatants with an unnerving, non-lethal sensation of intense heat. Watch as the ray silently strikes and scatters the crowd. The active denial system has three great characteristics. 
first of all, it's safe. Second, it's effective. And third, it has a tremendous range compared to the other non-lethal weapons that today's warfighter has. This is the heart of this 100 kilowatt transmitter. This is the gyrotron. 200 kilowatts of uh, electricity is fed in and 100 kilowatts of radio frequency comes out. That millimeter wave energy comes out an aperture underneath the main reflector, hits the subreflector, which illuminates that main reflector and sends a roughly antenna sized beam downrange. Those holes that you see in the antenna are for the cameras and other visual equipment that the operator uses so that he knows exactly where that beam is going. It's operated by a joystick. The operator looks into the console, sees exactly what that antenna is aimed at, moves the joystick left, antenna slews to the left, same way to the right. Then when there's an individual who's identified as a troublemaker, he has a cursor, he can put that cursor on that individual, pull the trigger that's on the joystick, and the energy is sent down range at the speed of light. The electromagnetic radiation released by the active denial system is similar to the microwaves in your microwave oven in that it causes the water molecules in the target to become excited and heat up. But that's where the similarity ends. The ADS is designed to heat only the very surface of the skin. It does this by outputting only the carefully chosen radio wave frequency of 95 gigahertz. Even though it can easily penetrate clothing, the ADS generates a much shorter and safer wavelength of radio waves than those used in microwave ovens. The active denial system millimeter wave directed energy beam reaches 1 64th of an inch into human skin. So that is the most outermost layer of the skin, roughly equivalent to about three sheets of notebook paper. It is essentially affecting the pain nerves in the outermost layer of the skin, heating them up and causing an immediate repel effect. Even these stoic servicemen, aware of what's about to happen, engage, can't help but flinch when they feel the heat. This is the first time I've experienced the uh, beam from the active denial system, and it uh, feels like an intense warmth feeling, uh, kind of similar to opening a uh, very hot oven door, and it's a compelling feeling that you want to get out of the way of this beam. If you were not expecting this, it would very definitely shock you and make you want to move. The ADS represents just the latest effort to devise an effective ray weapon. Okay, it's safe, it's effective, and it has tremendous range. And let me tell you, if you have a crowd, I would much rather have this being used on a crowd than bullets, without any question, right? However, <clears throat> it's the same frequency, the 5G in this weapon, as it will be in the new phones and the new antennas that we are being asked to accept in our communities. And the difference is only in the power. The power of your phone is less than one watt, the power of this will be thousands of watts, but it's the same frequency. It's the same frequency. And there will be, as in any large population, India in the United States having huge populations, India having people who are thinner and smaller and not always well nutritioned, will be more vulnerable. And there will be some people, particularly children, who will be more sensitive. And all of that remains untested. Now you have in India the scientists who can test this. And you may have the freedom to do the testing. We don't. That I can assure you. And even in Israel, where the testing has been done, they are not going to be introducing 5G. And the Israelis know all about technology. And whatever we may think about some of their recent Political moves, which I cannot support, even though I am a visiting professor of medicine at the Hebrew University, when it comes to technology, they understand this, and this is, that is, they originated some of this research documenting the dangers of the technology. Now, where are we? The American Academy of Pediatrics now recommends reducing exposure. And they say on their website, avoid carrying it in your body, in a pocket, in your sock, in a bra. And by the way, the state of California issued the same guidelines, by the way, almost 10 years after we first developed, started to develop them, David. Before my book was published, I met with them, with Herberman, at the state, and they drafted the guidance, and as you will find out in three months, they also tested phones. All of that has never been released until very, very recently. 
But the AAP website includes tips for reducing exposure, and they are the tips that you can find in these cards that Theodore and I will make available in the back of the room to you. And I would ask you to please sign up and let us know if you are interested in becoming a pod to distribute materials broadly in your country, in your university, because this is a message that's very important. And as you can see, I'm, the complexity of the message makes it very easy to confuse people. And we all want to believe everything is fine. After all, you couldn't live without your smartphone nowadays. It has revolutionized our lives. However, we need to take back control of our lives. And particularly when it comes to our children, I absolutely, you have to have a family policy. You collect the devices at, at the dinner table. There is no phones. And at night, no devices in their rooms. Or you take them out or turn off your router which is always a good idea at night for lots of reasons, because teenagers tend to get into trouble. I think we all know that, those of us who survived being teenagers ourselves. Now, I don't have time to go over this in detail, but I want to share it with you and just take a moment to walk through this. This is what France did. They tested all phones. They tested more than uh, 300 phones, almost 400 phones. And you see the iPhone. When they tested it with the manufacturer distance, which is, by the way, in a holster, you it was barely you safe. Microphone. When they tested it at the manufacturer distance, it was barely safe, right? 1.45 in safety is, uh, in the US is 1.6, in France it's 2.0. But when you do the actual testing with, uh, in a pocket, look at the change. Look at the change. Almost three times more. And if it were applied to the US, look at the levels. This means that if cell phones were a drug, they would be illegal. They violate their own safety standards when tested as they are used. And this applies to iPads as well. The iPad is called a tablet. It's very subtle because it belongs on a table and it's tested. 20 centimeters away from the body of this big guy. It's not ever been tested for little children with their short, stubby hands to hold it and sit with it right over their reproductive organs and hold it close to look to see things. Or the Alexa that they love to hug and sing to. These are all tested 20 centimeters away from a large male. And yet, within India, because I've met with the telecom industry and I've met with the health ministry, the health ministry is wonderful. They're solidly behind. You've, you have in India some of the top researchers in the world on this field. You do. And the health researchers of India are united in their concerns. And they are outgunned and outmanned and underfunded compared to the telecom industry. You want India to move into the 21st century and be a leader as it can be. And I know that Modi has said we're going to lead in technology but it should be wired, it should be fiber optic, it should not be wireless. Because wireless, as Jui Chawa and many others will show you, really exposes you to exposures that have not been tested completely and where we have enough information to know, first of all, they violate their own standards, and secondly, it damages sperm, it increases the risk of malignant and terrible cancers that we don't want to see develop in a country that is so vibrant and young. Your average age is so much younger that it, the risk is so much greater because of that. So this is just to give you some idea of how the business community responded. And this was more recent. But even in 1997, they talked about the fact, this is a cover from Lloyd's of London, uh, the 2010 report. And Thank you. I'm almost, this is my last slide, right? This is the worldwide action that has been taken in many different countries. In France, it's mandatory that phones are labeled. In Belgium, there is a ban on advertising phones for young children, although I learned last night from Christine this isn't always done. In, Min in India, there's mandatory phone labeling, and they have lowered their exposures to one-tenth of ICNRP. Uh, Cyprus, you'll be hearing about 
from our, my wonderful colleague Stella, who has done such a great job in publicizing the work of her group there. And these are just examples of the cards that are available from us that explain why and how to practice safe technology.